Good afternoon. My name is Annie Kamara, and I'm a member of the Festival Committee. Thank you for being here at our seventh annual Nantucket Book Festival. This festival belongs to you, and as long as you keep coming, we'll be here to see you. Um, thank you for reading, thank you for your presence, and thank you for your support. We give special thanks today to our sponsors, the White Elephant and the Athenaeum, and to the Inquirer Mir Marianne Stanton and the Methodist Church for use of this beautiful sanctuary today. Um, welcome, and a greeting we have hoped to deliver for so long. Welcome, Louise Honey. <laughs> We feel so fortunate that she is here this weekend and the rain is uh, going away. Um, I think I'm gonna tell you a lot of things you already know, but Louise's novels, 13 so far, go straight to the top of every bookseller list on the day it's published. She's won every prestigious award for these Three Pines novels, often in consecutive years. The Agatha, the Arthur, the Nero, the CWA Dagger Award, and the Dillis Award. Um, her novels are published in 25 languages, and in 2017, she received the Order of Canada for her contribution to Canadian culture. And she's won our hearts. And she's won our hearts with the creation of Armand Gamache, Rain Marie, their families, their colleagues, and the townspeople of Three Pines. Um, we're also giddy when we learn the um, pub date of the next one, which, by the way, is November 27th, when The Kingdom of the Blind is in bookstores. <laughs> she's shown us bravery, she's taught us about friendship and loyalty, and she's given us a model for a world that's more sane, moral, and hopeful. We come a little bit better when we read one of her novels. And now she's here with us. Please welcome her to the podium, Louise Penny. So happy to be here and so happy to see so many of you out. Thank you. I know some of you have traveled um, a distance to be here, and I'm extremely grateful to all of you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you to the uh, Nantucket Book Festival. They've issued this invitation a few years, and I wasn't able to come the last couple of years, but they kept up. And as soon as I could come, I think it was the first one I said yes to. To be honest, I'm not even sure they reissued the invitation, but. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> and to Maddie Holstrom. Maddie's one of the organizers of the festival. I, I don't know if you know her. Um, she's wonderful and a longtime friend. And she, Maddie and I go back just 10 or 11 years. She was one of the first people, she was working at Barnes and Noble at the time. And she was one of the first people to kind of discover the books and really, really promoted them. And, and she and I got together before an event and had dinner with her, uh, her daughter. Um, I still remember it, the daughter was about to go into nursing school and is now graduated and probably has grandchildren by now. So, everything in my mind is like a couple of years ago, isn't it? And then now, now I realize, oh my God, that was 40 years? No, that wasn't, that was only about 10 years or so. But it's wonderful too to be here. First of all, I'm having a blast. I think I've bought Nantucket. <laughs> um, I've asked my uh, wonderful uh, publicist who works with a publisher and is here with me today, Sarah Melnick, to make sure I don't go into a realtor's office. <laughs> However, having walked by a realtor's office and paused and seen all the numbers, first I thought it was a telephone number, and it turns out... <laughs> the price. But when Maddie and I first got together, and, and she, she came to a few events, and there were, you know, like, I don't know, two or three people, five or six, then the next book there would be 10, and then the next book maybe 20 people. So to look out at all of you, I don't take it at all for granted. I'm absolutely overjoyed. Would you mind? If I don't, does anybody here follow my Facebook? Ah, excellent. Well, guess who's gonna be in it? 
Now, if you're here with someone you shouldn't be, <laughs> all right. Oh, you're so attractive. Here we go, over here. Oh, now at least one person is ducking. <laughs> Thank you, this is also to send to the publisher so he knows that I actually showed up. <laughs> Speaking of the publisher, Still Life, I'll tell you how Still Life came about uh, in, in just a moment, but, um, which is the first of the Gamash books. Um, and, and eventually what I'd like to do is open it up for, for questions, because that's actually my favorite part of, of these um, gatherings. Um, but Still Life, I was um, well into my 40s by the time Still Life was actually published. But I had wanted to be a writer since well, almost as long as I can remember. In fact, I remember the exact moment I realized I wanted to be a writer. Um, but yeah, I had had a lifetime to dream what it would be like to have my first book published. And it would involve a private jet. <laughs> I used to lie in the bathtub and practice my interview with Oprah. <laughs> oh, good question, Oprah. <laughs> she and I would become best friends. And then I'd have to unfriend her because she's very cloying. <laughs> Yeah, this whole thing worked out. So when Still Life actually came out, I was overjoyed, of course, and prepared for my tour. So I, I, I waited, and I waited. And then about a week before the on-sale date, I thought, well, maybe, you know, the publisher is clearly busy organizing the tour. <laughs> so I should probably call. So I called, and, and um, I said, I'm ready for my tour. Mr. Martin, and Mr. Martin said, who is this? <laughs> said, it's Louise Penny, my book Still Life's about to come out. And he said, well, we're not gonna send you on tour because you're a debut and uh, nobody's gonna wanna see you. <laughs> and I thought, no, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> How could that be? Um, so I, I, I hung up and I said to Michael, my husband, I said, Michael, I think we should take the entire advance for still life. And with it, we will buy lunch. <laughs> and over lunch, we will discuss sending me on tour. So God bless him. He said, that's a good idea, honeys. So we went to McDonald's. <laughs> and we designed a tour. And we went all over North America. And do you know what? The publisher was right. <laughs> Nobody showed up. Do you know what? It, 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 it's not really so bad after a while <laughs> if nobody shows up because it's a little bit like, you know, if a bear uh, in the woods, uh, you know, because there's no, there are no witnesses except Michael, of course. So we can go then go out for dinner slightly earlier than planned and pretend it never happened or that this is all part of the long range plan. I mean, who really wants readers on a book tour? <laughs> the problem comes when one person shows up, right? And they're sitting, this is about where you're sitting, right there. And you know, you know, you know the moment when they realize that they're all alone. But by now, they can't leave. They're trapped, I'm up here, I'm looking at them, they're looking at me, and, and we really both wish they would just die. Because <laughs> now I have to go through the whole thing. And it was like that for years. It wasn't really until the sixth or seventh book that people started showing up. And I remember talking to my editor, Hope Dellen, about this. And, and, and feeling kind of discouraged and, and sort of down, because and, and, it's a lot of work to go on. After a while, the publisher started actually paying for it and sending me on Bob's airline at the back, <laughs> <laughs> staying at the by the wee. Um, but they, they would pay for it, and, and uh, I would say to her, you know, this is this guy's a, oh, it's a lot of work, and nobody is showing up. And she said, she asked a really interesting question. She said, now, how many author events, talks, did you go to before you were published? 
and I, had, I hadn't been to any. And I'm a voracious reader and a huge fan of, of writers, and I hadn't been to any. So then it's, I began to really appreciate the one person who does show up, or the two, or the three, or the hundred. So, you know, again, I am triply thrilled to be here, and, and even more thrilled that you're here. <laughs> Let me tell you a bit about how still life came about. I, I'm, as I said, I wanted to be a, a writer since, actually, it was, I was eight years of age. It sounds like I'm going to go way into my childhood and then, which I am. <laughs> Fortunately for you, it's riveting. So I was eight years of age, and I, I was a very fearful child. I was afraid of everything. I was afraid of bugs, I was afraid of heights, I was afraid of holes, I was afraid of night and day, really afraid of other children. But my cardinal fear, and I don't think this is unusual, you might have suffered from it as well, was a fear of spiders. I was petrified of spiders. Um, and I used to just, the only place I felt safe and sovereign was in my bedroom. I used to just love lying on the bed with a book. And if, to be honest with you, it's still my favorite place in the world. Michael used to call me a horizontalist. <laughs> <laughs> I was either always trying to put my feet up in a bathtub, on a hassock, in the bed. Um, but I was eight years of age, and I was, I was sitting on the bedspread. I could still feel it nubbly underneath, and reading Charlotte's Web. It's possible I was a slightly slow child, because <laughs> about halfway through Charlotte's web, before I realized <laughs> <laughs> Now, to be fair to my eight-year-old self, I really hope I knew that Charlotte was a spider from the get-go. But what happened in that moment changed my life. It was transcendent. What happened was, in that instant, I realized that I loved Charlotte, and I wanted nothing bad to happen to her. And in that moment, my cardinal fear was lifted. And I understood as a child whose entire day, whole life is prescribed by the least fearful thing to be doing, to have the most fearful thing lifted was power beyond imagining. And I understood that the power rested in the book. It was the power of storytelling, the power of words. And from that moment on, I, I suspect my entire life I would have been a voracious reader, but from that moment on, I knew I wanted to be a writer. Because if reading was that powerful, imagine how powerful writing was. I, all of my fears weren't, weren't lifted, of course. The fear of spiders being lifted did not hugely change my quality of life. Um, and so I continued to be a fairly fearful person. I realized that actually, looking back, and, and I write a lot about fears because I understand what fear is. Looking back, actually, I wasn't physically fearful. I, would, I went skydiving, I went hang gliding, I did all of that. Um, but I was very emotionally fearful, very emotionally closed off. I didn't have a lot of friends. I, I didn't talk to a lot of people. I was extremely shy and very introverted. Um, as I've gotten older now, obviously, I've overcome that, uh, partly because you really kind of have to if you're going to have any quality of life. Um, but I've become much more, um, not necessarily fearful physically, but certainly much more cautious physically, but much more adventurous and open emotionally. So things have kind of flipped a little bit. Um, but as I said, I, 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 it took me a long time to grow out of the fears. And I think what happened was I became a journalist. I was a, just really too afraid to try to be a writer because what happens if I try and fail? So it's a little bit like one of the, one of the themes in Waiting for Godot that maybe sometimes it's best not to test a dream because suppose you can't do it. And then you, you lose that whole view of yourself. And I wasn't willing to run that risk. So I, instead of writing a book, I came up with all sorts of excuses why I couldn't. I'm too busy, I'm too tired, I've got too many other things happening, on and on and on. All of which were fairly legitimate, 
But we all know if you really, really want to do something, you'll do it. And what I really, really wanted to do was come up with excuses. Uh, I became a journalist, which was close, close enough that I could sort of fool myself that I was still, I was still a storyteller, some of which was fact. <laughs> Most of it was fact. I worked at the CBC. Um, but I wasn't writing the book. Um, and then I, I reached a certain age, and I think many, I mean, my experience obviously is as a woman and women friends, and I suspect we all do, where I was 35 and I looked at where I was in my life and realized I hadn't achieved what I had hoped I would achieve, what my eight-year-old self thought, where my eight-year-old self thought I would be at 35. Um, and so things had to change. And eventually they did. And I can go into that later if you have any questions about, about how that transition happened. Um, but I met Michael. We fell in love and, and got married. And lovely man. What he did was at some stage I came out back from working one, one day. And this was, as I said, with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. If you know anything about Canadian or Quebec politics, I was sort of front line for a lot of the political debates on Quebec sovereignty. And nobody came out of that unbruised, no matter what side you were on. The final vote for sovereignty, it was actually against sovereignty. Quebec wanted to break away. But it was a razor's edge vote. And it genuinely could have gone either way. And I was hosting the national coverage of this. And just before we went to air, before the polls closed, we had a call from, or one of the researchers had a call from his father, who was very high up in the no camp, which was do not separate. It was a federalist camp. And he said, we're going to lose. Quebec's going to separate. I just want you to be prepared for that. And they pass that on. And generally, as a journalist, you try to separate yourself from, from that and, and separate the intellect from the emotion. But that was a, a body blow I'm, I'm not sure anyone ever recovered from, even though we eventually won. But it was just so close. And, and it was shattering, as I said, for everyone. And I came away from that night somewhat different than I went into it. And Michael saw that, and he said, he said the most beautiful thing. He said, it was almost as wonderful as the day he said, I love you. Almost as good as that. <laughs> what he said is, if you would like to quit work in order to write that book you've always wanted to write, I'll support you. I'll support you. Isn't that beautiful? And he meant it. Thank God he meant financially. <laughs> <laughs> But he supported me in every other way, too. So I quit work. I think I made a strategic error because I, I, I did say that I was quitting work in order to write a book. I may have implied it was going to be the best book ever written. <laughs> and then I suffered from five years of writer's block. Five years. Five years. Two years would have been enough. Five seemed excessive, even to me. It got to the stage where when Michael came home from work, he, he was afraid to ask me how the book was going. <laughs> it became like my mother when I passed 35, and she stopped asking the question, you know, have you met any nice young men lately? Any women? Any farm animals you might? So Michael got to that stage too, where he just, he was afraid to ask. Um, and then a number of things happened. As a journalist, I just want to make sure I'm um, watching the time. Oh. <laughs> um, as, as a journalist, and having covered a number of accidents and, and bad things that happened, and then you do the, the post-mortem on it, of course, as a journalist, you try to figure out why something happened. And these things often appear to come out of the blue, whatever has happened. Um, but once you take a closer look at it, clearly they haven't come out of the blue. There's three or four or five. It's a series, it's a parade of smaller events, often overlooked, that had to fall into place exactly as it fell into place in order for it to happen. And you know, had you turned left instead of right, had you left the house five minutes later or earlier, had you been were wearing red instead of black, these things wouldn't have happened. Um, but the same with wonderful events, too, when you start taking a look back, all the things that had to, all the stars that had to align for wonderful things to happen. And I look back on how 
still life, how, how that started, never mind actually got published, but how do you start a book? How do you break the writer's block? And a few things had to happen. Michael and I were living in Montreal um, at the time, and we ended up moving outside of Montreal to a village some of you might recognize. <laughs> south of Montreal, north of the Vermont border. Um, so that was very helpful. And then I fell in with a group of women, all of whom are extremely creative. Writers, but, but poets, painters, dancers, actors, um, all sorts of musicians. They, they did a, just a, a range of things. And But as you know, and as I've learned, Creativity sprouts all sorts of different ways, but the taproot is essentially the same. And so they formed this group of women, not, not big, I think there was five or six of us at the time, um, called Les Girls. And we would get together once a month and we would talk about the process, how it was going, problems they were having, challenges they were having, why something was working, why something wasn't working didn't give each other advice unless it was asked for. It was just listening to how the process goes. And they invited me to join them, which is extremely generous because I actually wasn't writing at the time. And I said, I'm, I, I, I'm not writing a book. And they said, well, are you a writer? And that was a really interesting question. And I thought about it and I said, yes, I think I am. And they said, then you're, you're welcome to join us. Wasn't that amazing? So, I've learned in my life, not simply as a, in professional, but in my personal life, to be very, not everyone has to do this, but I do, be very careful about the people I choose to have around me. And so I am very careful, and I was very lucky to be surrounded at that moment by, and going forward too, by extraordinarily brave women and gifted women. You, you probably won't see their names up in lights anywhere or buy their books or paintings or go to their concerts, but, but gifted and brave, and I needed that. Um, and so I would go to their concerts. I would go to the Vernissages, their first, their opening nights of their art shows. And I saw just terrific successes, and I saw things that could not be considered successes. And, but do you know what I saw? I saw that the next day, they got out of bed, they put their clothes on, they walked down Main Street, magnificent. That what happened the night before did not impact who they considered themselves to be. We all want a success, they wanted a success of course, but not having that success and the approbation of others did not cripple them the way I was afraid it would cripple me. And I was so inspired by that, and I understood that the lesson was that trying and failing wouldn't harm me. It was the not trying that was going to kill me. And then, and then the final thing was, I, I looked on the bedside table. I mean, it's so banal as to be embarrassing, and I know you won't tell anyone else, so I'll just <laughs> tell you looked on the bedside table, and like, like you, I, I read, and certainly did then, small c, catholically, I have everything, biographies, histories, novels, nonfiction, but very well represented was crime fiction. And I had again one of those, as my friend Oprah would say, <laughs> an aha moment. <laughs> and I realized, I realized, this went hand in hand with what I was saying before about learning from lay girls. I understand between standing up and seeing that and the time my bottom hit the bed, what came to me was the place that the approval of others has played in my life and how limiting that has been, not because of the others, but because of what the power I've allowed, I have given them, the need I have had for approval and the fear of disapproval. And that's what was stopping me from writing. The final hurdle was, suppose it's bad. Suppose my mother doesn't like it. Suppose my brothers laugh at it. Suppose my former colleagues snicker. Suppose the woman who voices my GPS hates it. <laughs> I, it, it, it was paralyzing. 
But as soon as I sat down and I looked and I took a good look, I thought, no. I need to write a book just for me. A book I would read. I would read. Nobody else has to read it. Don't even have to worry about whether it's published or not. Just write a book I would read. It is so simple that, as I say, I, why did it take five years to come to that? I can't explain it, but it did. And so at that moment, I went downstairs to the kitchen and drew a map of Three Pines. I still have that map. It's on a cork board above my desk. And I put the first thing I created was the bookstore, because what's the most important thing in the community? It's, it's the books the power of stories. And then very hard on that, and not coincidentally right next to it, is the bistro. <laughs> and then on the off chance that the bistro runs out of pastries, I created a bakery. <laughs> you, you need a fallback, always a safety net for carbs. And then the, the grocery store and what. Have you noticed that there is not a vegetable in sight? <laughs> I guess french fries could be, les frites could be considered vegetables, but. Or, or in some cases, ketchup, I guess, is considered a vegetable. <laughs> um, and then I, I realized, too, that, and this was all part of that package, that, that sudden realization, that gift from the universe of understanding that the book may not be published. And that had to be all right. And it would probably take me years to write it. So there was a pretty good chance that the writing of it would be the only joy I would get. So I have to love the writing of it. Because while if it's not published, I will be disappointed, but I won't have any regrets that I've spent years on this. So I, every decision I made was selfish. I created characters who's, who I would choose as friends. I, as I said, I created a village I would choose to live in. And then it came time to create Gamash, the main character. He didn't have a name at the time. And I was thinking, now, who, who will he be? And at the same time, I had heard that Agatha Christie, and I don't know if this is even true, but Agatha Christie apparently grew weary of Poirot. I don't know if you've heard that. Because I think my theory is it's because he never evolved. He was essentially the same, and I love Poirot, but he's essentially the same in 1920 when he was first burst onto the scene is 1960 with the last book. So he never, he never grew, and so Christie grew tired of him. I'm not sure you could blame Poirot for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, I, want, I don't want that to happen to me. I want, if I am so lucky that the book is published and that it turns into a series, which was really the big dream, I don't want to grow tired of my main character. So I thought, how do, how do I mitigate against that? And I realized what I need to do is create a character I would marry. Someone whose company I would love for years to come. So I was pretty chuffed with this and I was starting to write the book and I had character sketches all written out and I came down for breakfast one day and Michael was, was at the table and he was talking about world peace or something like that. <laughs> And I thought, damn, I didn't create him at all. I transcribed <laughs> the man. <laughs> in fact, anyone who comes to visit, the publishers and publicists and, and people who come to interview me, and they look around and they think, my God, you have no imagination, do you? <laughs> <laughs> so they're all here. <laughs> uh, um, and so that's, that's how still life came about. Um, and I can get into how it got published, but I think we are at the stage, I'm at the stage where I would love to ask you to, to ask me some questions, if you have any, and, and that'll guide the conversation forward. Um, the only thing I would ask is, if you do have questions, is to, because the, the books now are so intertwined, um, that you not ask a question that will ruin a book for someone else. It's not also simply, you know, why was so-and-so the murderer, which is not a good thing to ask. <laughs> but also, you know, why did so-and-so become an astronaut and get shot in outer space or whatever? You know, just the character development, try not to ask about that either. Um, so does, are there any questions? Yes, at the back. Oh. 
Did you hear the question? Um, she wonders about the pet duck. <laughs> the pet duck was not planned for <laughs> until, until I wrote that sentence that the duck was not in the book or anywhere close to that village. And that's part of the fun of writing is those unexpected moments and following a lot doesn't end up in the final draft, but just sort of say, well, what about this? Let's just try that, suppose that. That doesn't work, so you just end up dropping that or dropping this or using it in another book or bringing it in a little bit later. Um, the thing with Ruth, Ruth is this, this wizened, drunken, disorderly, old, embittered poet um, who, who acts as a kind of a... Um, Greek chorus for the, for the village. And I realized one of the dangers is having, because I wanted to populate with people I would choose as friends, and I don't normally choose horrific people as friends. So there was a danger that it would just be too filled with too many just nice people. Um, so I wanted a kind of a counterpoint to that. But I, it was also important to me that while the nice people have darkness, it was important to me that Ruth have a saving grace. And her saving grace is a degree of self-awareness um, that comes out in her poetry. But Ruth is kind of born inside out. The books are about many things, as you know, least of which is probably murder. It's about life, it's about choices, about community, about the power of friendship, our yearning for belonging. It's about love in all of its forms. And it's about duality. It's about the beautiful setting and the horrific crime. Uh, it's about the public face that we all have, the veneer that we all have, and thank God we do, of civility. And then the inner turmoil, the gap between what we are feeling and what we're saying. And Ruth ha is sort of born inside out. She keeps all of her civility very well hidden. <laughs> and on the outside are all of her more venile thoughts. Um, she has absolutely no ability to edit herself. So when, in the third book, The Cruelest Month, each of the first four books is intentionally set in a different season because I wanted Quebec to be a character as well. And I wanted people who are reading it, again, if I'm lucky enough to be published, if they're reading it in Sri Lanka, to get a sense, if they read the first four books in order, of what it's like to live in Quebec for a year. So you get the, the different, not only the different climates, but the different scents, the different smells. I wanted the books to be very sensuous in that regard, not sexual, but sensuous. Um, I've forgotten what I was gonna say. <laughs> the duck, yes. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> um, so I wanted each of the first four books to be set in a different season, and the third book was set at Easter, uh, obviously the spring, and the village had just had a, a, an Easter egg hunt, and, and Ruth, being Ruth, has decided that she's going to beat the kids to it and pick up all the, all the chocolate eggs. And so she's looking around and she comes across this nest, and she picks up the egg and realizes it's a real egg and puts it back, and someone says, no, you can't do that. Now they, the, the mother won't nurture the eggs. So Ruth takes the nest and she takes it back to her home, and everyone figures she's gonna make an omelet. But in fact, what she does, and nobody realizes this, is she nurtures the two eggs. And that's, this is why Rosa is actually more of an allegory than, than a duck. <laughs> duck as allegory, who else comes up with that? I think Jane Austen had that in one of her books. <laughs> um, when the ducks are hatching and just fighting their way out of the shells. Ruth, it hurts her so much to see this struggle and she's so afraid that the duck won't make it because one of them in particular is just not, not quite doing it. And so she cracks the shell and helps it out. Uh, Lillian was the duck's name, uh, the little one. And, uh, and in helping that duck, she ends up hurting it because the duck needs the struggle in order to grow. And that's a, that's a real allegory for all our lives, isn't it? That we need the struggle in order to learn, in order to grow, in order to thrive, 
that duck couldn't thrive. And it just it breaks her heart when she sees, when she realizes what she's done. Um, and that's one of the reasons why Ruth is the way she is and why she pushes people away is that every act of kindness she sees as hurting people she actually loves. So she tries to hold off acts of kindness. And what happened to Lillian just underscores that for her. But, but Rosa survives the duck, the duckling, the little duckling. And not only does Rosa bond with Ruth, but Ruth bonds with Rosa. And so this, this embittered old thing now has a duck. So, but it's, it, it, it annoys me sometimes, and I understand why people do it when journalists write about my books, um, and they say in The Mad Poet with the Duck. And I think, now if I was reading that, I would think, I'm gonna give that book a pass because it sounds just too ridiculous. And they don't understand the relationship and where it comes from and why it's there. Now, I dare someone to ask me another question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry, we have, a, we have a microphone. You didn't deserve the mic. <laughs> I'm sure you've been asked this before at many of your talks, but um, it's interesting that you have all of these murders going on in this one little tiny town. And did that ever worry you about uh, how people would think about that? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, yeah, that, that turned out to be a bit, you see the thing is, the truth is, I genuinely did not think that that the books would, would be published. I mean, I hoped, but I would have made Three Pines just a little bigger, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it struck me after about the, I think after the third book, because um, in fact the fourth book is set somewhere else. It's, there's still Three Pines characters and some of it goes back, but I realized after the third book that it, Three Pines would not sustain the murder rate. <laughs> So, and nor it was becoming increasingly difficult to call it idyllic when. <laughs> so what I did was I said, now if you look, most of the murders don't actually happen, some of them do, but don't happen there. But the characters are somehow involved and, and you know, Gabash is involved. Um, so every, certainly every second book is primarily set somewhere else. Gives Three Pines a chance to repopulate. <laughs> And I feel, you know, honestly, I think anyone who's stupid enough to move into a village deserves what they get. I feel no guilt at all. <laughs> so let's go over here. Is there a question over here? No, I don't think so. I'm just getting that young woman to run around. Is there a question over here? Let's go maybe on the side, not quite. <laughs> Let's go for this guy, this fellow, yes. And then I'll, then I'll go for the, hi. Oh! <laughs> Aww. That's nice. <laughs> Is it on? No. <laughs> okay. In your book, the, A Great Reckoning, uh, this, the central metaphor there is the map of three pines mm -hmm. that you just referred to. What I was wondering is, what informs you, like you, you made this map and then you think, oh, I can build a novel around this. Like you did with the um, experience of the Dion quintuplets. Right. And you, you can build a novel around that and it branches out from that, but how does that happen? You know, you look yeah, at no, a still that's a, life. That's a really interesting, I'm, I'm actually just writing now the 15th book. And some of it is written here, obviously, and not set in Nantucket, but written in Nantucket. So, um, and I, I was thinking about that. It's, sometimes it's something really small. Sometimes it's a turn of phrase that I hear somewhere and think, I can literally build a book around that. It just, it just sparks an idea. Um, a, a, a poetry, I, a lot of my books are inspired by poetry. I, I, I suggest to emerging writers, whether they ask for my advice or not, I suggest that they read poetry. And I don't care, I don't, first of all, I don't care if they actually take the advice or not. 
Um, but I don't care if it's a greeting card or uh, Winnie the Pooh or my favorite happens to be Auden or anybody. It's just that poetry manages to get in, often in a stanza, what I struggle an entire book to get. So that, that can often start it. Um, the, the, the poets of the Great War, Sassoon and the others, um, moved me a lot. So that, I think that affected writing um, A Great Reckoning. So I think that's, that was the nugget for that. Yes? And now they won't talk without a microphone. It gets very... <laughs> uh, I'm absolutely fascinated the way you talk about writing now, which is it's fun. You get inspiration from these other things. But having also been a journalist in the previous century, I knew <laughs> how important deadlines are. Yes. Whether I wanted to write or not, I had to meet a deadline, and so one writes. Right. How do you, what is the discipline, what is the inspiration to keep you at it when you just, your oh. characters are not behaving, you're writing. Uh, oh, you know, you know that feeling. Really. is not there. Are you, are you writing a book or have you written uh, a book? That's not a fair question. I get to ask a question. <laughs> Lock the doors, we're going to get an answer from her. <laughs> now she hands back the microphone. Um, no, you're absolutely right. I was extremely lucky to have uh, started at an early age as a journalist and learned deadlines and learned discipline. Um, I, and that has served me in good stead. As you said, there, it, it is dreadful. It's almost every book, often somewhere in the middle. It's actually called the muddle in the middle, where you, you just you lose your way. The first, when you first start, you have the idea, you're excited, you have a push forward. And then you hit the middle and you have all of this, these ideas and things that are just sort of floating around and characters are, aren't, aren't sharp. Um, you know where you need to end up, but you don't know how to get there. It's t it is awful. And that's where you just sit down and write. What happened in this, when I was writing the second book, which was terrifying because nobody paid attention when I was writing the first, only Michael knew I was writing it. And then the book sold, and I remember my, my agent phoning me up, um, and she's British, and maybe as a Canadian I hear it differently than other people, but whenever someone with a British accent speaks to me, there is an implied, you idiot. So, I, so she called up, and I always imagine her with a vat of martinis and a cigar, and she's putting ash off her bosom. And she said, Louise, you'll never guess what happened. I've sold three books. And I said, Teresa, that's fantastic. Mine and who else's? And she said, Louise, you idiot. They're all yours. And you have one year to write the next book. Now, it took me 45 years to write the first. <laughs> and I didn't even know how that happened, to be honest with you. It's like, like a, it was, it felt like a gift from God. Here's your book, now stop complaining. <laughs> now I have to write at least two more. And I, and I have a history of, of writer's block. So I went to, I was writing and writing, it wasn't good. I was writing for the approval of others again, again, and I just knew it, it would be okay, but it wasn't what, the books deserved and the characters deserved. So I went to a therapist and she said something that, again, that changed my life. She said the wrong person is writing the book, which was not initially very helpful. <laughs> so I said, what do you mean? And she said, your critic is writing the book. She said, you need to thank the critic you need to bless the critic, and you need to show the critic the door. But you don't lock the door because you're going to need her again. <laughs> and your creative spirit needs to write the first draft. Just write, just write with gratitude, write with joy, write with awareness of how lucky you are that nobody's dropping bombs on your head, that you're not starving, that you live in, in freedom. Just write. And so that's what I did. And she said, if you want to write 10 pages on a rose, 
Right, it doesn't matter. It won't end up in the final draft. That's what the critic's for. So that's what I do now. I just write, I just write, I just write, and I am very aware of how lucky I am. And then the second draft, the critic comes in, helps me shape and, and, and hone and winnow, and then third draft and fourth draft. But that's, that's, that's what I do now. And I set a word count every day, 1,000 words. This morning, set the alarm, got up at six, wrote 1,000 words. Tomorrow, set the alarm, get up at six, write 1,000 words, then, then I come out into the world. It's a great life. One, we have time for one more question. There was someone over, did, was there someone over here? Yes, let's take, oh, a man. <laughs> uh, down, oh, there, the person who's standing up. I've already observed that there are more women than men here. Yes, but uh, the men who are here are, in the words of Spencer Tracy, terse. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about the evolution or progression of your books, and I should add that I've read and enjoyed every one of them. Thank you. And I should also say that my sister is ecstatic that you've <clears throat> moved into her building in New York. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, what fun. So anyway, I'm, 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 I'm reading all the books, and all of a sudden there comes a time when Monsieur Gamache must retire. No. Oh, when he must be tired. Retired. Retired. Now, don't yes. say too much, all right, so that people here who haven't read the books... Okay. All right, it's not ruined. Fair enough. But my question is... Yes. I thought at that point that you had decided you were no longer going to write any more gamache books. Right. Is that so? No. <laughs> No, I was always going to write more gamache books. I just felt at that time, because of what had happened to him, it seemed natural that he would take a step back. But, you know, I love gamache, and I'm going to continue, and, and I, it allows me to explore everything I want to explore. So um, that's a wonderful place to end. So thank you for that question. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>